everyone. My name is Catherine Gorley, and I'd like to thank you for tuning in today for another episode of the Injury Prevention Academy, a podcast brought to you by Dorn Companies, the country's leading wellness-based pain management and injury prevention company. Dorn is committed to reducing costs of healthcare and workers' compensation, as well as reducing lost productivity, which has resulted in over $100 million in savings over the last 20 years for our clients. Joining us today is Dr. Lee Newman. Dr. Newman is a researcher, physician, public health practitioner, and educator. Dr. Newman is recognized for his scientific and practical contributions to occupational health and safety, total worker health, immunotoxicology, biomarker development, and more. He has authored over 200 scientific papers and over 120 books, chapters, and monographs. Dr. Newman consults for government agencies, businesses, labor groups, and community organizations, and is currently a professor at the Colorado School of Public Health. Welcome, Dr. Newman. Thanks, Catherine. Nice to see you. It's nice to see you. And I know that your, your work in total health um, has, has really informed the, the whole idea of it, uh, but also its, its, its execution. So total, to give a little bit of background, Total Worker Health originated from the 2003-2004 NIOSH Steps to a Healthier U.S. Workforce Initiative. By 2017, students at three universities could receive certifications in Total Worker Health, and there are currently 10 NIOSH-funded centers of excellence to explore and research concepts related to it. So how has the concept of Total Worker Health evolved over the last 20 years? Well, it's it's been great to uh, initially witness it and then become part of it uh, as as head of one of these centers of excellence. Uh, the the things that I've uh, I, I've seen probably um, accelerating, especially in the last five years of the fifteen years, has been uh, a a sharpening of of uh, our understanding of what total worker health contributes to worker safety and to well being. Um, the the research is getting uh, deeper, richer, and uh, and more practical. Uh, the engagement that we're seeing in the in, in the um, in the corporate community, uh, as well as in academia, is accelerating. Um, in fact, some of the most innovative work that I'm seeing is uh, is coming out of uh, HR departments and and uh, health and safety committees. And, and wellness committees that are redefining themselves as total worker health. Um, so uh, it's, it's an exciting time to, to see it on a very practical basis um, growing and on a research basis, uh, seeing you know, the researchers contribute the science that, um, that you know, justifies the kinds of changes that companies are making. And, and how would you, what would be your main definition as to what total worker health would be? Yeah, so that's that's been evolving as well. Uh, so at this point, the way that I sum up total worker health, it's the it's the concept that we need a more holistic approach to worker health, safety, and well being, and uh, and uh, and a key component of that uh, comes from uh, from integrating uh, um, some of the silos that exist right now. Um, so bringing together uh, safety principles with wellness principles, um, bringing in organizational uh, principles. Um, if, you, if you put those together, uh, then you get total worker health. So uh, it's, the, you know, it's formally defined as the policies and the practices of an organization that address worker well-being, including their safety and health. Absolutely. And, and understanding that so much of, I'd say, true safety is not just the individual things that you're doing for for a job task, but for your experience in the company environment as a whole, and also making sure that you can stay safe and go home to your loved ones. Yeah, absolutely. And and, and you know, Catherine, I think one of the things that's been uh, that that's been um, interesting to witness is. Uh, you know, you know, we've been talking for I don't know how many years have we talked about safety culture, and uh, and you know there was this this evolution in the thinking among among my my friends and my students who are safety professionals that they could take um, safety just so far they could you know do the engineering controls the PPE uh, they could they could substitute safer processes and safer materials etc. 
and then they still would hit a wall in terms of their injury rates and uh, and fatalities. So um, so realizing that one way to get um, get uh, beyond that was to introduce this concept of safety culture, right? Where you start thinking more holistically about well, what are the human factors that contribute to uh, to our injury rates? Well, uh, total worker health is kind of a, a you know a, a encompasses safety culture. Uh, to me, uh, even a more in, uh, holistic uh, kind of view of of uh, worker well-being, which um, you know does in fact lead to um, accomplishing the tasks that we set ourselves in creating the safety culture, mm -hmm. um, but extends it to a health culture. Um, and I, and let me just you know put kind of a finer point on it. Uh, you know, you think about um, what are the what are the, what's the nature of the job that contributes to injuries? What's the nature of the way the task is done that contributes to injuries? But then, what are the 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 the, the factors that the uh, that that the business itself is contributing to the injury risk? Um, and uh, and by that I mean things like um, uh, you know what kinds of shifts do we put people on? Uh, are our are, are employees having uh, having uh, sufficient time to rest and recover from strenuous tasks? Right. Uh, are we are we you know getting the kinds of uh, of work schedules so that people uh, can recover from fatigue? Are we addressing the workplace stressors that contribute to mental health and distraction, which may lead to to uh, to injury? So it's it's thinking about um, you know some of those. Uh, you know, things that very often live in the domain of, of human resources and risk management that actually can contribute to reducing um, uh, our injury rates. Um, and beyond that, maybe even promoting people to be a little healthier at the end of the day than they started. Right. And, and I think one of the major changes that I know I've seen over these last few years, you know, you mentioned that the last five years have really accelerated a lot of this total worker health understanding, but also that evolution, you know, has been that focus on mental health support and the true effects of, of like you said, those workplace stressors, uh, but also the, the different ways that fatigue kind of plays a role in how you how you complete your your job tasks uh, but also how you can contribute to the company as a whole so how how has that kind of understanding evolved in these last couple of years yeah uh, we're seeing a, a lot more of the research pointing to the relationship between uh between uh, sleep and uh and recovery uh, and job performance. Um, so, uh, so that that literature has been burgeoning, um, and there's an interesting relationship that we've been observing between uh, the relationship between someone's manager or supervisor uh, and the employee, and how that affects people's level of stress, their sleep, and their fatigue, and and sometimes a vicious cycle that occurs if you have um, you know difficulties in the in within the organizational relationships between supervisors and employees. So uh, so, so some of those uh, kinds of issues are around fatigue, are are this are at this intersection between uh, how do we uh, how do we cultivate um, uh, managers and leaders who understand the role that they play to promote the psychological well-being of their team and benefit by seeing um, you know, people who have less fatigue, less uh, stress, and, uh, and improve productivity and safety. Um, so yeah. those are all turning out to be uh, interlinked. Right. Well, and, and, and I love that you brought up the fact that obviously our, our, our personal um, our, our, our personal experience and our, our, our personal relationships within the work environment is so, I think, integral to how, how we approach the idea of total worker health or even just safety, say, say in general, because that's going to affect communication. That's going to affect, you know, if you're you know, let's say you're constantly looking over your shoulder, it's, it's going to not lend itself to being able to focus. Right. Um, so is that something that, you know, when when we're talking to different management um, across the country, is that communication kind of stressed? 
Yeah, uh, and, and uh, you know the uh, the the role of supervisors and managers and and peers in terms of uh, communication, um, reinforcing for each other the importance of doing the job safely and doing the job well, and and uh, and in a in a non blameful way is that a word in a way yeah. that we don't blame others. Um, uh, uh, enabling people to uh, identify when they are experiencing stress, um, when they when they need help um, is uh, is part of the evolution. And, um, uh, you know, I, I, I've worked through the years with, um, you know, industries where it's, um, you know, there's a stigma attached to disclosing how you feel. Um, whether you're experiencing uh, uh, symptoms of depression or anxiety or even fatigue, um, uh, to be able to call out that you actually don't think that you can do this job at this time in a way that can be done safely. Uh, there's been a lot of stigma and, you know, like this, this, you know, just get the job done kind of attitude. Um, I, I've done a startup businesses myself and, and you just, you know, you, you just burn, you know, you, you just keep burning through uh, your, your personal uh, capital psychologically and cognitively and physically to just get a job done. Um, you know, we're, we're trying to move people away from that kind of uh, an attitude because, you know, it, it's, uh, it, you know, it, it leads us to bad places in terms of job performance and success of the business. Right. Well, and, and just with health in general, you know, um, it's that um, I, I, I always think of it as almost this kind of old school way of thinking of, like you said, just kind of push through it you know, don't, don't think about anything, just, just get the job done. But obviously that's going to lead to things like burnout. That's going to lead to higher levels of stress. And that very much impacts the body. Yeah. You know, people get headaches, people start to, to kind of not be able to really engage with what they're doing because of the higher levels of stress. So I can see that having those conversations now, and I'd say especially in the last couple of years, because of obviously we had so much stress happening out here. How do I not let that affect me right here? Right. So, so having those, those conversations, I think, you know, like you said, is so extremely important and I can really see it growing yeah. already. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's definitely, um, you know the the most successful uh, organizations that we work with are defining their success in a more people centered way, uh, and uh, and and guess what? It it shows up in the the price of their stock. <laughs> it yeah. shows up uh, in their retention. Uh, it shows up in in ways that uh, may not be classic return on investment ROI metrics, um, but actually can be, uh, if you will, recognized as a as a derivative. Of having a people-centered approach, um, you know, you if if you can have uh, greater retention, uh, if you can attract uh, you know talent uh, to your organization and keep them, uh, you know, there there are a lot of benefits all the way around. And so um, so that's that's kind of part of the business case of it. But in a people-centered approach, there's this value-based um, uh, you know notion that you know really what we're here to do is to yes be successful in our service in our products. Uh, but um, but not at a human cost, but actually at a human benefit. So um, okay. so those are some of the values behind the total worker health approach. Yeah, and I think um, what's what's really kind of interesting, and you know, in 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 saying this, I'm I'm obviously working working from home. I don't have a a, a big painting in my office. Um, you know, Dorn works with national companies supporting their employees both on site and off. You know, mm -hmm. so many, so many employees today, so many people today, they're they're working from home, you know, like like obviously, you know, a lot of the the different office workers. Mm -hmm. So how does the tools of total worker health lend itself to supporting employee wellness uh, virtually as well as in person? Yeah, it's uh you know, I think one of the things that uh that uh, COVID has shown us is that uh, we we now have to well a couple of things. One is we have to think about those of us who uh, could do our jobs remotely um, and uh, and start thinking about what are the the health and safety issues that arise when people work from home. 
mm -hmm. um, or from a remote location. There are lots of businesses that have been working remotely for a long time. Let's, you know, let's, you know, let's be clear right. about that. Yeah. But a lot of us had to figure out, you know, uh, you know, like in, in March of 2020, you know, how to mm -hmm. suddenly do that and not always done that well. Um, so, you know, that was definitely an issue for, uh, for a lot of workers for the first time. Um, you know, when, when we uh, started approaching this, from a worker health perspective, using total worker health as a framework, uh, we had to start thinking about, first of all, the, the stuff that has to come first. We had to think about safety. So, uh, you know, we start off by going like, okay, what is the, what's the ergonomic setup of that home office? Right. And, uh, and, and for, you know, and, and how are we going to equip that? How are we going to ensure that? How are we going to promote, um, you know, the uh, best practices, which don't include uh, sitting on the couch with the cat, doing your work, but actually having an ergonomic workstation if you have to be tied to a, to a computer. Uh, right. How do we reorganize the, 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 how do we take advantage of the flexibility that working from a home environment offers you? And flexibility is, um, is you know, an important part we've learned in, uh, in the, the psychological well-being of our workforce uh, and our retention strategies, even as we're starting to return to, to formal offices. But flexibility, mm -hmm. realizing that you have certain advantages by working from home, maybe you're getting in a little bit more of that physical activity uh, that you were missing. Maybe you are taking that that break that you probably should be taking if you're in an office, but maybe don't. Um, uh, you know, to walk the dog, uh, you know, and come back in and then be refreshed and come back to the computer. So right. you know, so there were there were both. Um, so they start off with sort of the safety concerns of of the home office. Uh, and then we were able to shift to, well, what are the potential benefits? How can we use the 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 work from a home, the remote work, as an asset for promoting um, productivity and uh, of our workforce? And a lot of organizations, in fact, witnessed an improvement in productivity. Um, so um, so that's those have been uh, two themes that we've seen uh, running through the uh, the work from home uh, situation as it's evolved. Right. And, and understanding that you can, you can support your employees um, through, obvi obviously, it's like you said, through that ergonomic support, uh, but also through that communication as to how can we make sure that this is working with, with your schedule and also, you know, understanding that you can still get what you need done. Obviously, when when you are working from home and, and finding that balance, I, I think that's something that I can see kind of focusing in on is establishing that balance, yeah. right? As, as we go through even just like the next five years of there will be that balance, I, I believe, of working from home, uh, but also being able to fully support the company, but still obviously be part of the company culture. I think that's something that even like in total worker health can, can play a large part in that. Yeah, and and uh, I, I think you're absolutely right. I think one of the things that uh, we have seen uh, evolve over the last couple of years, again as a consequence of of the pandemic, uh, has been recognizing that uh, working remotely can also be an isolating and lonely experience. Yes. And sure, we can find each other on our Slack channel and on our on our Zoom meetings. Um, uh, but uh, but the human contact uh, is something that we need, and uh, and for many people has been uh, sacrificed over the last couple of years, and has been a contributor to some of the mental health challenges that we have. Um, example: When we uh, started to uh, reopen our offices here at the university, um, yes, we had people who uh, you know now cherished the ability to work from home, and right. work remotely, and save themselves the commute time. And by the way companies benefited from people not commuting. They were actually, they're, they're shown to be getting more work minutes from employees when they're not commuting every day. Yes. Um, but, uh, but you know, the, the reward uh, for me working from home was, you know, not having to drive to and from, reducing my carbon footprint a little bit, if that's of mm -hmm. concern to me, which it should. Right, yes. Um, and, uh, and, and yet people saying, as much as I appreciate that, I still want to come into the office uh, a couple of days a week, especially if there are going to be some other people there, because I need that contact. Um, parts of what I do, especially the creative work, the collaborative work, 
goes better when I see people in person. So I, th I think we're now doing a little bit of a reset, a major reset um, around the balance between uh, working remotely and, and working in person. And even companies that uh, that you work with who uh, you know, have uh, remote workforces and have had them for years still uh, usually make some point of trying to um, bring teams together in person uh, with a certain frequency, recognizing that 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 kind of contact is important for, um, like you said, building the culture, retaining the culture, um, uh, helping people who are newer to the organization uh, uh, feel a part of the organization, which leads to better retention. Um, so, uh, you know, so there's uh, there's value in find, striking a balance between the two. Right. And, and understanding that even, you know, as you said, different different kinds of employees, you know, in terms of, of age ranges, in terms of generations have a different approach to, to, to how they work. You know, do, do they value a little bit more of that true in-person, you know, work or, or is it really, yeah, I can get stuff done just individually and maybe come together every once in a while. Um, I was actually looking at um, at a study that the United Nations published um, in 2019, and they looked at population growth, and they projected that about one in four people in Europe and North America will be over the age of 65 by 2050. That's a that's an incredibly large part of the population, and it will directly impact how companies support their long term workforce for longer periods of time, um, but also how you know in 2050 it's going to be it's going to be the Gen Zs who are who are within that that population uh, you know bracket which is kind of crazy to think of. Um, so how can companies implement new policies and trainings that not only support their younger employees um, as well as their new hires but also support the aging workforce currently being seen? Right, uh, you know, Catherine, it's a it's it's a, a topic of very active research, uh, and for very good reason, as you point out, right. uh, the uh, you know the the whole concept of the aging workforce uh, is is actually just one dimension of something we haven't really talked about, which is you know we we've talked a little bit about the changes to the way that work is done, mm -hmm. uh, to um, you know changes in the nature of work itself. But we, the we, the you know, the employees are changing too, right? right. We are um, we are aging. We are accumulating, unfortunately, more chronic health conditions, uh, ranging from uh, from uh, cancer and heart disease and diabetes and hypertension and di and, and depression. Um, so uh, and and we we bring that part of us to work. So you know so. What total worker health tries to do is to accept that we as individuals are bringing uh, certain uh, facets of our lives and our health to work. And we're looking for ways that organizations can, number one, find a way not to make those things worse. And maybe number right. two, find a way to actually be contributors to uh, the reduction in those health risks. Um, with again a, a a derivative being a healthier workforce, a more productive workforce, a, uh, a more readily retained and an engaged workforce. Um, so you know, so how do we actually do that? You know, if if you're if you're a company today, uh, you know, how do you do that? Is um, is one of the challenges. We usually start by saying you look at um, uh, you you look at the data. Uh, you know, and yes, I'm I'm a researcher and I'm a, I'm an academic, but I've also been a business owner, and uh, and you know we we should do things as data driven as we reasonably can, um, mm -hmm. and uh, and among the things that one can look at if you're you know if you're self insured, you have some insight into how much of the health care dollar is going into uh, certain kinds of pharmaceuticals. Um, it gives you an, a general insight without knowing people's individual situation. It gives you a general insight into how much is going into uh, the, the treatment of anxiety and depression and hypertension and diabetes. Well, if an, an asthma, for example, mm -hmm. and so if those are the kinds of things that, that the healthcare dollars are going to, it's giving you um, uh, just as one metric, a little bit of an insight into the kinds of health issues that are facing a workforce. What can an employer do to help promote um, health around uh, around those kinds of conditions. Um, 
so uh, so that's one of the areas where we encourage organizations to do is start by uh, you know using your data to understand what might be some of the health issues facing employees um, without without getting uh, too much into people's uh, personal lives uh, trying to collect um, uh, uh, information from employees about some of their greatest concerns and needs um, you know whether uh, we're we're you know talking about a workforce where we have a large number of, of people of childbearing age, for example, who are going to have somewhat different kinds of, of uh, health needs than, uh, than uh, say, a workforce, which is, uh, you know, maybe more, um, you know, uh, uh, mid-aged um, male construction workers, right? So, you're, you know, you, you have to think about what's, what are my demographics of my workforce, as well as the major kinds of, of health issues that they face. And in those two examples, maybe in, in one example, it is promoting, uh, uh, you know, better access to lactation rooms and, and addressing some of the needs of, of working uh, mothers. Um, on the other hand, if, if we're talking about, um, you know, mid, mid career male construction workers, we need to be having open conversations about mental health and the high rates of suicide. Right. Yes. So these are issues that we as employers need to be uh, understanding better and then uh, understand how we can contribute to uh, some of the the uh, the solutions that um, that lead to a healthier workforce. Yeah, and and I think you touched upon something very, uh, very, very important of that. You know, even with a a wide range of of generations within um, a specific workforce, you're going to have more communication and more discussions about what is actually affecting them as a whole. So, you know, I know, I, I, I think that, you know, costs of like, say, overall average costs of, say, healthcare um, or, or even therapy services could go up in terms of usage because we're having those conversations, right? So that's almost, you know, it, on one hand, it's, oh, you know, why is, why is there a higher rate of, of healthcare being had in this sphere, but also understanding that it's a good thing. You know, that's why these conversations are happening. It's, it's so we can address some of the issues that people have always had, but now it's, we're having those discussions about it. Yeah. The, the, the trick there, Catherine, is that, um, uh, is that there's still a lot of siloing. So you may have one part of an organization, which has to own the um, you know the, the 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 red line of those healthcare costs, mm -hmm. and another part of an organization which would potentially be owning and reaping uh, the benefits on on their ledger of uh, a workforce that's that's healthier and uh, and more productive, right? Right. So you know so you know how do you actually bring bring those messages to, together to say you know we as an organization. Are going to overall thrive. Uh, yes, we may have increased costs in in use of of mental health services, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, uh, will that overall lead to uh, you know to you know to a, a stronger workforce and stronger uh, workforce? Right. Yes, but absolutely. Unfortunately, sometimes we just look at these as separate pieces, and and so all of a sudden, the you know the environmental health and safety people and the and the and the people who are responsible for the healthcare plan are getting dinged because of the of the costs, and they want to spend more on on this and that for safety and health and well being. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, and you may have the CFO who's looking at different metrics that that can't tie the line between that and the benefit that leads to their ledger. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, I think, you know, and, and, and we've talked a little bit about that communication and those discussions from supervisor to employee, but I think that it's very important to have those conversations on that management level, on that higher management level, because you need to understand kind of that cause and effect of, of what is really, really, you know, what what your employees are truly experiencing and and how you can help support them because you want to be able to see that long-term workforce it's it's expensive to to replace an employee it, it really is i think they said that it actually costs about the amount of their salary to yeah. to replace an employee and you know if you start to do that over and over again 
you're going to start to see your bottom line going down. Um, and I know that HR and safety are increasingly becoming partners mm -hmm. in establishing strong wellness cultures, especially within those small to medium-sized companies where you can have a lot of those really in-depth conversations. So, so what do you think that each of these departments can really learn from each other in pursuit of those goals? Yeah, uh, you know, one of the things that we've been promoting is uh, is leadership training in total worker health, and bringing together, um, uh, you know, senior and mid level managers as leaders in the organization, uh, mm -hmm. and that could include people from HR uh, as well as people who are you know line managers, bringing them together to do leadership training around total worker health. In fact, we've created an online training for that. Um, specifically targeting leaders to understand what their role can be in promoting uh, total worker health. We, we also um, have been um, uh, finding uh, strong support for what we'd call a shared leadership model uh, in which having more than one person in an organization uh, own, and I'm air quoting here, you know, yeah. own uh, worker health, safety, and well-being. Um, you know, very often we'll see uh, an organization do a lot of the right things, uh, and then um, you know the CEO uh, takes a new job, or you know, or the the head of HR turns over, and mm -hmm. uh, and that stuff goes out the window, and and culture changes again. It reverts um, uh, sometimes into a more negative place. Um, you know, so um, you know, so the you know the uh, idea that uh, you um, the spread the the knowledge across uh, the leadership ranks in an organization. Um, uh, is uh, one of the strategies for the organization to have a more sustainable uh, and stable um, program around uh, health, well-being, and safety. Well, and I think a lot of companies experienced that um, with with the pandemic, when all of a sudden there was there was that quite a lot of there there was that large turnover, you know, within companies where all of a sudden they had to scramble and say, well, this person had all of this information. They had all of these files. Where are those? You know, right. how how do we continue to grow our company realizing that we some of that information has been lost? Yeah. So so absolutely I, I love that whole kind of shared ownership, as mm -hmm. you said, of of knowledge, uh, but also understanding as to really what drives a business, uh, but also how to keep your employees safe. Yeah. The other part of it is that we we need our managers to be safe. Uh, yes. you know, we're employees too. And uh, and um, and you know the the rates of uh, of depression and anxiety, uh, of of workplace stress, financial stress, the other stressors of owning a business, uh, a lot of those fall on on the shoulders of managers and leaders in an organization. And so uh, establishing a culture where there's uh, where we reduce the stigma and we have more open uh, sharing of what our own concerns are and where we become less functional as leaders of an organization is incorporated into the model for total worker health. Um, it's yeah. not all about our reports. It's about us as well. And um, and you know you, you you've heard it before. You know, put on your you know you get on the airplane and what do they tell you to do in an accident? put on your own mask first before helping others, right? right. So, so that's, you know, that's a, a metaphor for uh, what we, uh, you know, teach leaders to do is to do their own check on their own health and well-being and safety in the job um, as well at the same time that they're, um, you know, showing the, the concern and thinking about what the organization and what they can do for the people who report to them. Yeah, and and understanding that, you know, some of that, you know, really, really reverberates within a, within a company to establish that culture of, you know, if management is looking, is, is looking inward and making sure that they're kind of checking in and making sure they're okay, you know, let's, let's have the employees do that as well. You know, have, having that rapport and having that, that understanding, I think is so important. And, and you really touched upon the, the idea of having that holistic approach to to worker well-being you know why and and obviously i'm sure that we could have multiple kind of catastrophic examples as to why when companies don't do that um, it really affects them but but why do you think the company should take a holistic approach to worker well-being well it, it probably the 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 single biggest reason is that 
no one part of the company can do it alone. And that's, you know, we've seen that time and again, you know, it's, it's not in the, uh, you know, I, 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 I run a, a training program uh, that includes training people who become uh, leaders in occupational uh, safety and health. Uh, they become the safety officers, they become uh, ergonomic specialists, uh, they work as industrial hygienists, and uh, and and you know they 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 know part of what needs to be done to promote the the safety and the health of the workforce. But um, you know if you ask them, well, you know what what about all this uh, well being stuff? They're like, well, they don't know any more than than um, you know somebody who's you know uh, you know person on the street, uh, right. and uh, because you can't be an expert in everything. Right. No. So, so if you accept that we can't know everything and, you know, I come from the medicine side, right. I'm a, I'm a physician and, mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, I've, I've learned a lot from my colleagues who are safety professionals uh, mm -hmm. and industrial hygienists and HR professionals, but I'm not an expert in what they do. Right. right. So, so what do I need? I need an interdisciplinary team to, to, to share knowledge and collaborate on, on the overall solution. And what are we solving for? We're solving, we're solving for uh, how to have a healthier and safer workforce across the entire work span, uh, which includes an aging workforce and people with chronic health conditions or with different kinds of life events that, that, you know, that come upon all of us. Yeah, so it's, it's it, that's why we talk about an integrated approach is because, you know, none of us has a corner on the market. Right. Right. And 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 what would be I'd, I'd say, what would be your advice for small companies, you know, looking to integrate that total worker health uh, kind of um, idea into their current safety culture, um, but also while taking into consideration their their current budgets and really preparing for for their, their future workforce? Yeah, great question. You know, about 10 years ago, um, my, my uh, colleague, Lily Tenney and I uh, said, you know, we're going to, we're going to focus on working with small enterprises and mm -hmm. medium sized enterprises because more than half of working Americans work in small enterprises. Uh, right. There are higher rates of injuries in smaller enterprises uh, and the overall health of workers tends to be poorer in small enterprises, um, mm -hmm. uh, and having started businesses myself, uh, you know I, I know where that comes from. It comes from, gosh, you know I did a startup and uh, and I had a runway and I had a certain amount of money, uh, and and I had to make payroll, uh, and sometimes I right. went into my, my own personal savings to make payroll yeah. and experienced the uh, you know the the financial stress of trying to just keep a business going until it could take off, right? Mm -hmm. um, I was fortunate. I, I I made it. I made it to to take off, um, but a lot of enterprises uh, struggle with that. So how do you do something that's scaled for a small enterprise? Mm -hmm. um, Ten years ago, we started a a, a service um, uh, through the Center for Health, Work, and Environment called HealthLinks, and HealthLinks um, provides advising to small enterprises. They can go online and they can do a self-assessment of how are we doing in these different categories of health and self safety and well-being and having organizational um, uh, policies and practices in place. They can self-assess and then they can jump on a call with, with an expert who provides them with you know, a half an hour advising. We used to think we need to go in in person and meet with people and said, we don't have time for that. Right. Get on the phone right. and tell me, let's talk. Let's set some goals and, and tell me how I get there. And mm -hmm. so uh, we realized that, uh, that there were some standard questions that we could ask, but then you had to get into what's the individual situation of that particular business owner. Um, you know, what is that small business uh, seen as their biggest challenges? If you're in a food services industry, it might be that uh, you have, um, unfortunately, a fair amount of, uh, of substance use. And, mm -hmm. um, and you may have uh, workers who are uh, even going through recovery, but they're coming back to a workplace where there's, uh, there's a lot of access and use of, of drugs and alcohol. I mean, right. you know, that's one scenario, right? Very different than a scenario where you've got a, a construction company that, um, that you know, does a large amount of excavation work. Uh, and and still faces major issues 
uh, around traditional safety challenges, right? Yes. So, yes. so the, the needs differ at different ages and stages of the company, the industry that they're in, and their size. Um, so, you know, so, um, so you can get, so HealthLinks became our approach for nearly 800 businesses now uh, in like 14 states, a lot here in Colorado, mm -hmm. uh, to help them figure out uh, for themselves where to go next. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, there's not a one size fits all answer to that. Uh, right, right. Um, but then I think that that one size, I mean, that 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 doesn't that doesn't really apply to to any to any issue that 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 you're trying to solve. It's not just a okay. Well, let's just put money towards it. Okay, that that's not going to fix the underlying problem, right? That's not going to prevent, say, you know, especially in safety, that's not going to prevent the injuries. It's just going to address the injury that happened. You know, how do we how do we? And I think Total Worker Health is so great because it provides that support. It provides that that prevention level of of safety, uh, but it also starts to give starts to give ideas as to how we can address the issues that are already happening. Yeah, and they have to be practical, and they have to be yes. inexpensive. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I've been there and done that. You know, you, you know, you're trying to make payroll. You're going like. Am I really going to shell out for this or that program or for this or that piece of equipment? Uh, mm -hmm. Even though, yes, I know we need it, but people need a job and we need to get our service out there. You know, I, these are the kinds of real world challenges that we hear every day from the small enterprises. Um, and, um, and uh, you know, but, uh, you know, at this particular moment, uh, we're, in a, we're in a weird moment in terms of uh, access to skilled uh, workers. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and so, uh, you know, the equation is even changing in front of us, um, you know, in terms of, you know, what do you invest in? Well, part of what you may be investing in is a total worker health program and culture in order to be able to attract uh, the, the talented people who you want to have come to your company and not to one of the other five or six uh, organizations down the block. Yes, right. and that's and that's something that that we're already seeing with some of the younger generations. Yes, they want to know about the pay, they want to know what they're doing, but a lot of their questions are about how does the company support their employees? Mm -hmm. What, you know, what what are they doing to make sure that they have a kind of quote unquote healthy culture and a very strong um, strong wellness culture so that they're not walking into something that will not serve them long term. Yeah, no, absolutely right. Uh, and we, we hear that a lot from the, uh, the, the small businesses, the medium sized businesses where we spend a lot of our time talking. Yeah. So I think, um, I think just in, in, in talking with you, having that, that kind of step into how you can integrate total worker health into your current safety culture or, or current safety programs, uh, but also understanding that it is a multi-step process uh, mm -hmm. to, to getting one implemented and having it and having it really benefit long term, I think is really important for management to understand, but also companies as a whole. Yeah, you know, one of the the the, the things that we've um, done in in uh, recent years. Is to try to find uh, some of the, the the themes that run through almost every business that we've worked with, and then provide some uh, some uh, you know self uh, uh, you know self uh, um, uh, uh, I don't know the word is I'm looking for, but uh, tools that people can use themselves. Yeah, um, do it yourself tools, mm -hmm. um, and one of them uh, again through Health Links has been uh, a module where people can go through themselves and. Uh, and gauge how they're doing around uh, addressing mental health in the workplace. So a mm -hmm. whole module just on on mental health, again, backed up with advising for for um, you know managers and supervisors who who want the advising. Um, another one has been around how to create a family friendly workplace and what mm -hmm. goes into uh, creating a family friendly workplace. And understanding that for some people, family may range from uh, their plants to their to their pets. Uh, to um, you know, to the people who are you know living in uh, in their same home with them, right? Um, uh, so family friendly has been an important area. Uh, having uh, a module now 
uh, helping organizations become recovery friendly workplaces, given the the issues we have around opioids and fentanyl and uh, and and substance use disorders. Mm -hmm. And these are people who are continuing to work or who are trying to return to work. Uh, we've had a lot of demand here in especially in the last year, uh, increasing demand for us to provide uh, ad advice, self-paced advice, and also actual advising mm -hmm. on uh, how to be a recovery supportive workplace. So, oh, these interesting. Have some, so these have been some themes that have been coming up time and again. So we said, okay, let's, let's put some energy into creating tools that people can use online and then mm -hmm. back up with advising. Yeah. Well, and, and, and I, and I love the idea of, you know, kind of bringing it home in terms of, you know, when, when you're looking at a piece of machinery and you're looking to, to make sure that it's operational, you have a checklist, right? You have a, is everything tightened? Is everything in good working order? And that's something that you can bring into safety and into personal wellness, you know, checking in with yourself, checking in with your team as to how is everyone feeling? Did, was someone up all night because the baby was screaming or was someone up all night because their favorite team won the night before and they just, you know, sleep was not an option, right? But, but, but understanding, like you said, that need for recovery, but also checking in with mm -hmm. your team to make sure that you are creating that wellness workforce, that that wellness culture, and and understanding that it will help the company as a whole. Yeah, yeah. You know, the expression that we use in from the psychology world is psychological safety. Uh, do are you in a uh, in an organization where it's okay to admit to be able to say, you know. I'm not well, or I need the break, or, um, or you know, to imagine being a manager and saying, you know, I'm having a down day, and, right. and sharing that with the people you work with. And by the way, almost all of us have some down days. If you don't, I want to yes. meet you. But, right? <laughs> well, 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 and also understanding that you know, it's just everyone has down days, and to pretend otherwise can also be a be a contributor to burnout and stress. Right. So, so having the psychological safety is a way of opening the door for us to be uh, more open with uh, the people who work with us, work for us, and uh, and um, and you know ends up being kind of a gateway to um, promoting a more human centered uh, workplace. That's wonderful. Well, thank you, Dr. Newman, for for joining us. Yeah, this has been a really great conversation. Yeah, no, I, well, I I hope people uh, you know take away uh, something from this that they can use in their in their day to day lives. Absolutely, absolutely, and and thank you all for joining in to Dorn's Injury Prevention Academy. Tune in next time to learn more about the innovative steps and programs taking place in today's world of safety. Mm -hmm.